Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey, Jim, how you doing? Hey, John, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Do you know what episode this is? Uh, I'm going to say episode four, A New Hope. Very close. This is episode 111. 111. 111, which means it's our 11th episode. We're almost halfway through our first season. So it should be, uh, it should really be one dash 11. Yes, it should. Uh, and I tried that, but we're spending more time on uh, the numbering of these episodes than we are talking about magic in the book. But the system through which we upload this uh, will only allow whole numbers. I see. For the episode numbers. I found that out the hard way early on. So yeah, so it, it you can think of it as just episode 11. It's the first year of episode 11. Even one, hey. Episode 11, that would make it chapter 10? Yes, very good. Hey, oh. Thank very you. good. Thank very, very good. You might want to just get a glass of water and relax for a few minutes. because that, that was It's like excellent. doing a magic square. <sighs> oh, dear. Well, anyway, um, before we dive in to this episode, uh, I want to do a quick check of the mailbag because we uh, we get really nice emails from people or comments uh, uh, on the sites or whatever. And I got a uh, really nice note from a magician and an author named Mark Heron. I hope I'm pronouncing Mark's last name right. H-E-R-R-E-N. He's written a ton of books uh, and he's in Switzerland. Uh, and he is a, a hang on a minute. He's in Switzerland, yeah. Switzerland, Europe. Switzerland, Europe. Switzerland, Kansas. Exactly. Yeah. He wow. is um currently, uh, as far as I know, our most distant listener. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. It's probably around forty five hundred miles from Minnesota to Switzerland. I'm just kind of uh, ballparking it there. I don't know exactly where he is. Um, but this time I'm going to throw this out to all of our listeners. If you think you can beat that, if you're further away from Minnesota than 4,500 miles, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And we'd also love to know how you found the podcast, because in Mark's case, it popped up as a recommendation on his platform, which is, hey, that's great. That's terrific. So we'd love to know how people are finding us. And if you want to chat with us, just go to the EliMarksMysteries.com website and click on contact and send us an email. We'll find out who is further away than Mark Heron. But anyway, thanks, or Mark, for that love for that lovely the note. Closest. I'd like to know who's the closest. Oh, uh, boy, it might be my wife, who's just <laughs> in the next room. Does she Actually, really no, listen? She, she doesn't really listen. Yeah, so that doesn't count. We got to find somebody close, too. So closest and farthest. Closest to the pin, farthest from the pin. It's and a it, game we're playing. It's the pin at your house? In St. Paul or my house no, in Minneapolis? Grass Lake Studios. I think mm. it's got to be the studio. Okay. Right. Whoever's closest to Grass Lake in Minneapolis, uh, let us know that as well at elimarksmysteries.com. Yeah. Click on contact for that. Anyway, let's dive into, we've got kind of a, a, a three-episode cycle going. These next three episodes, uh, our last two were with Dick Cavett. We got great comments on that. Oh. The next three are going to be devoted to people who have grown up in magic. Kind of uh, like Eli. Our hero. Exactly. That's the idea. I wanted to talk to people who had a similar experience to growing up in a magic store. Well, lots of magicians have grown up doing magic. We both know the famous Jay Marshall quip when a kid said to him, I want to grow up to be a magician. And Jay said, son, you can't do both. How Groucho is that? What a great ver Very, very Groucho. Anyway, so these next three episodes are, are going to look at people who literally grew up around magic. Coming up is Liberty Larson. She's a fourth generation magician whose family founded the Magic Castle. And uh, we're going to talk with the comedian and impressionist Jeff Altman. Uh, his father was Arthur Altman, well-known card man, and also handpicked by Harry Houdini to be the president of the Society of American Magicians after Houdini resigned it. It was pretty prestigious. Yes, very. Uh, we had a lot of fun talking to both Jeff Altman and Liberty Larson. Those are great interviews and those will be coming up in the next two episodes. But today we get to talk to Julie Ang. Now, Julie is the daughter of magician Tony Ang, and she essentially grew up in his magic shop in Victoria, Canada, Tony's trick and joke shop. Yeah, uh, she. The interview is great. I'm sorry I was unable to be a part of it, but I took the opportunity to listen to it, and she's a delight. In addition to being a terrific magician, Julie is also the executive director of Magic Canna. It's an arts organization dedicated to the study, exploration, and advancement of magic as a performing art. It's perfect for her too, isn't it? Yes, totally. So Julie's father. Tony Ng uh, bought the magic store when Julie was a teenager, and he immediately put his kids to work. To kick things off, uh, the first thing I asked Julie about was her memories of the shop. 
the shop was this magical place. Like as soon as you came in, we had it ready for you. That is to say, there were exploding pens, disappearing ink, you know, spiders that came out of nowhere on top of you. I mean, that was that was part of our fun. And it was the mischievousness of my father, who I think was just born with little horns coming in. <laughs> he was a mischief maker and he, he was very well suited for this kind of ambassador, hospitality role. I mean, he was always in hospitality. So when the shop comes along, we're right downtown in, in the harbor part of, of Victoria, very big tourist area. Um, it just became something that we did. Like this is, this is our gig, you know, we ran a hospitality, you know, emporium. <laughs> it sounds like it was a bit of a show when people came in. Totally, totally. And it's, and then that's the thing, like part of it was, I was thinking a lot about this, you know, we, we had this, this uh, mandate to sell, like it's a retail store, but it, there was really this responsibility to be kind of, you know, ambassador to Victoria. My mm -hmm. dad was always about uh, good hospitality, fine showmanship, and the shop was this natural extension of, of that, that persona, that mandate that he had himself. He was in, um, he's always been in hospitality. He used to be a bartender in, in Victoria where he ran like the, the drummer's lounge at the mm -hmm. Red Lion Inn. And that's where that skill set came from. That's where that whole, um, hey, have you, you know, John, have you met my, my daughter, mm -hmm. Julie? Like he was always about introducing people, connecting people, bringing people together. So the shop was just another bar in many ways, except it was a different kind of uh, public. So the didn't shop he had, also run a, didn't he run a bartending school at one point? He ran a bartending school too. Yes. So when he was at the drummer's lounge, he was very successful, very popular as the bartender and bar manager because my father didn't drink. So he was the perfect kind of bar manager. And the neat part was he really built a skill set of managerial skills that he was able to consolidate, turn into the premier school of bartending. Unfortunately, my dad had um, a, an asthma problem as a kid. And then when we were doing a show, he was still performing while being a bartender. And so the shows were a big demand and there was a little bit of stress, you know, with the hol holiday season, especially. So he was doing the shows, he was working at night and back and forth. And there was a little bit of an incident where he had, um, uh, he had an illusion where he'd finish it off and there was a big puff of smoke, literally a big puff of smoke. And he, he just caught like just bad circumstance. He caught a really bad inhale and it collapsed one of his lungs. Oh, wow. So this is a time when smoking was prevalent in the bar and he just could not be in that environment anymore. So he, he changed gears. He said, okay, we're going to not maybe be in front of uh, the patrons this way, but I'll teach people how to be behind the bar. And that, that was another, you know, learning lesson of, of sales for me as a kid. And that all those skills, believe it or not, John, you can take those and put them behind the counter of a trick and joke shop and still be quite successful. <laughs> I imagine. So you're a teenager when you start doing this? Yeah, the, the shop really came about, I was maybe, I'm just thinking back now, you know, I, I couldn't drive yet. And I remember taking the bus down to the store, you know, it was like, oh, I've got to go to the shop after school. Like it was, it's like this, this, this chore, you know, you got to do your chores and everyone's like, you get to work in a trick and joke shop. Like who's complaining here? It sounds like a pretty good gig. It was a really good gig. And I, you know, you can only say that now you try and convince a 13, 14 year old, <laughs> you got to go work. So this was not voluntary, I guess. So, but it was, you know, it's family business, right? So this is how I've been raised in family businesses right from the get-go. My dad had that show at the beginning when I was born. He was still, he was performing. He had me on stage very early on. My mother was always assisting him. My mom went along with all of his crazy ideas, every single one, including the shop. Because the bartending school was doing really well. It was a very successful endeavor something my father could really grow and even, you know, retire with as, as a successful entity, but he always wanted a shop. So they sold the school <laughs> to open the store. <laughs> it's oh, kind of wow. like, you know, not like the natural progression of building a business <laughs> and building your retirement, no. but he, he did thrive. And I think one of the cool things about the shop is that it has a front and it has a back. 
And behind the shop, behind the scenes, behind the counter, behind, you know, the back mm -hmm. room, there's always like these areas. <laughs> and that's where all the magic lessons were and visiting magicians would want to come in and hang out. Mm -hmm. but there's a place for them to sit and, you know, chit chat and, and to be very social. So were you, I'm guessing you were demonstrating tricks. And yes. selling them. <laughs> was there a favorite thing you love to demonstrate? Was there something if if you knew for sure you could sell? If you got if you get this in front of somebody you knew you'd sell it? So that's that's the name of the game. Um, my job was to sell and I had to learn how to sell. And my father, you know, you have to remember this is a very mischievous, fun jokester, prankster kind of guy. So he loved the idea of of dichotomies and breaking down those um, barriers and surprising people. You know, this is part of his his design as a magician, his thinking as a magician. It, it, my father taught me how to do the demos, though. Like I had to, I had to sell the demos. And he, I must admit, I think he took advantage that at a time when I'm a young girl. You know, I was a kid, I was a teenager, but I looked younger than I was. So it looked like even more impossible. <laughs> like, how could this little kid, you know, surprise you with this deck of cards? You know, you must buy it. Like he liked that idea of, of making it appear a little more simple or direct. And I mean, I grew up with this stuff too. So I was very comfortable with it. So handling cards or handling the coins or these very strange boxes and brass things and, you know, colorful copper things, uh, cups and balls or floating all over the place. I mean, that's that's what I did. And I learned his demo routines. My dad had worked out these sets and these sets were designed to have sort of like a beginning, middle, end as all shows have. But he also designed it so it's sort of like easy, kind of not so easy, little sleight of hand. And so there was there was a range of skills that you could also sort of target. So um, there's a very straightforward prop thing, what we would call self-working. I could do that in my sleep, but he also had me do a little bit of the sleight of hand stuff just to employ, you know, the S idea you could, you could get a, those days was VHS, but you know, books, we're always selling magic books, um, tough books. Like these are hard books to learn from, but they were, they were sort of like uh, the entry point for a lot of young magicians, you know, just, it's a range of material. So I had to learn stuff from there as well. So it was a fun way for me to continue my learning with my dad. Uh, to, I would practice at the store. I mean, I would be doing this all day long. And in the summertime in Victoria, it was packed all day long. Between 12 and 5, it was always packed because tourists would come through not only in bus loads, but in the cruise ships. So you'd have thousands of people milling about your city for this period of time. And they, they had money burning a hole in their pocket. You know, they're here in Victoria. What are they going to do? They've been trapped on a ship. <laughs> they got to spend some money. <laughs> I was happy to help them do that. <laughs> you know, easily groups of 20 or more would come in at any given time. And our, our shop was in this narrow format. They'd all funnel down to the, to the, to the counter. And it was like the stage. And then they were the audience. And so you do the demo and everyone understands And after the demo, it's now time to buy. So what mm -hmm. can I get for you? What did you like? How did you like that one? I think that would work for you, <laughs> you know? And, wow. and so that was how we learned how to sell and you had to read people, you know, you, I could tell who could do what, mm -hmm. you know, just, you could just kind of tell you, you learn to read your audience. So you're learning to read an audience one-on-one -on -one like that. At what point do you start going out and doing an act? Because well, demoing is one thing. It's a whole different thing good, to have an act. Yeah, it's a really great point. Demoing is definitely one thing. And don't forget, my mandate in, in that particular job was to sell a trick, like where. So you asked me if I had favorite ones. For sure I did. And it was because they had some kind of an impact. It was, it was something that we could pull out and you could sort of handle, you know, that was important. Mm -hmm. The magic had to be handled when I was in the store. It's almost the opposite when I was performing. It's all based on sleight of hand stuff you can't buy, you know, stuff that you can't necessarily learn um, from these days, YouTube downloads, right? Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting mix for me because I could then employ some of the sleight of hand that I had learned from my dad and use them inside of the presentation. But at the store, I had to be careful because if I did too much sleight of hand, I might be overselling something. Really? <laughs> so we had to sort of like disclaimer all of that stuff. 
so it's it isn't real. I mean, it's a kind of a progression, but it isn't necessarily a progression from being a demonstrator to being a performer. You didn't have to do that. What? Why did you make that leap? I think it was not necessarily from the store where I made the jump to performing. I think that for me, and I think I have a, a slightly more unique situation than a lot of my magician friends, because my dad was a magician when I was born. Like I was born into it. And I've often said that magic found me, you know, I didn't necessarily discover it. I was taught magic as a kid at a young age, at a really young age. I think I was four, maybe five years old. Now I've taught a lot of children magic as well through our various programs. I've taught them at the, both at uh, my dad's shop. We had community programs where I would teach kids, but I've also worked here in Toronto with a very special outreach program teaching children magic. And the, the, the idea of learning magic builds a lot of other elements inside of um, skill set that I think are would serve us in life. So mm -hmm. there's communication skills, presentation skills, confidence in front of people. And there's also this idea of of awareness of self, you know, and, and being able to, again, present things and sell things like sell ideas, sell a concept mm -hmm. of magic is difficult. So, you know, I was learning all of this stuff as well. And b having that as my upbringing, John, like that's my, that's like, those are my formative, formative memories. And now you bring that into this idea that I'm having fun as a teenager, you know, selling the stuff, working, getting feedback, getting positive feedback. And then my dad is a working magician. And, you know, he set me up with a magic show very early on. I was about 11 or 12 years old. So it was interesting that I've always been performing. The shop was just a part of my experience of performing. So going back into the shop, um, you've got people, you got two types of, of customers. You've got the tourists, but you also probably have the local magicians. Yes. In the Eli Marks books, one of the problems Eli has working in the store is that his uncle is a grouchy guy and will not sell someone a trick if he just bought something the week before and hasn't mastered it. And he has a kind of a hard and fast rule about that. But on the other hand, he also is constantly lending out books that he should be selling, saying, I think you'll like to try it. And if you like it, come back and buy it. So he has that sort of weird dichotomy of being very, very strict, but also being sort of generous. Did your dad have any kind of rules like that? Like with, not with the tourists, but with the, the real magician saying, no, you're not ready for that. It's, or did it's you deal with that? Yeah, a little bit. It's it's um it's a really great it's great for me to hear you talk about it like that because it kind of brings back a lot of those memories for me with the the shop always had a group of magicians. Now Victoria had a very active for a small town, it had a very active community of magicians and it still does. And it had the um the members, you know, always milling about the shop more or less. And and it became this sort of not, we didn't host a lot of meetings there, but, you know, it became a place where you could drop stuff off and pick stuff up and, oh, well, maybe I would, you know, pick up some books or something like that. But a lot of young people would come through and discover magic and my father would introduce them to the club, bring them with the, his arm around their shoulders and bring them into the group to try and, you know, if he saw promise and, and possibility in that young person. But my dad did have some tough rules. He got to know a lot of characters and he could tell by the characters where their promise would take them in terms of, I guess, fortitude in, in, in study or tenacity and learning. And there was a couple of kids that just did not have natural talent and, and parents would push them into these. And those kids were just, they're not interested, you know, so mm -hmm. quit pushing them. You know, it's, it's cute when they put on a top hat and have the cape on, but it's not for the kid, but the parents like this idea. So there was that kind of mix too. So he would have to sort of soldier on with with parents it was almost management of parents but then on the other side of the spectrum there's very talented young people and um every situation is different for that young person so my dad would definitely do what uncle harry does you know this idea of being really strict like why are you looking at that that's not for you like it just doesn't suit you and like he would really not berate them but kind of toughly love them in the saying that's not for you and yet there was always the lending of stuff, you know, here, just take it, bring it back. You know, it's because they couldn't afford it or, you know, they're expensive tools that these kids were getting into and could they afford that? And, you know, it's tough. You're doing, 
you know, side jobs, um, or you have no money. It's like, how do you, how do you learn? And he had a soft spot for kids who had potential. He always, you know, tried to help them in any way he couldn't. And there's lots of stories about the generosity inside of, of those, those kinds of situations, which I'm really grateful to still, you know, see and hear. As you look back, what do you miss most? If you take your father out of the equation, Okay. What do you miss most about your time in the magic store? The shop <laughs> was always really, you know, unpredictable. You never knew who you're going to meet, who you're going to run into. And you know, it, it was a retail job. So, you know, you had to open shop and, you know, go through all those, that, that procedure of, you know, the, the, the administration of it all. But I miss, I think, the fun of what a simple magic trick can do beyond two strangers, like with two strangers, you know, they, this person comes in, maybe a mom comes in with her, her young daughter and they see me behind the counter and they're like, well, you know, we're really shy. We're thinking about this idea of maybe learning a magic trick, you know, for something maybe for school. And I love the idea that my small contribution to that young woman's you know, idea of what magic can and cannot be. And to see her eyes light up and to see the possibility in her mind spark. Well, that's the stuff that is for me, real magic. You know, you can touch a life and give something of a, a different kind of gift. And I don't get that in a day-to-day -day experience anymore. You know, that, that idea of just coming across unusual situations and you never know who you're going to meet in a magic store. So I, I do miss that. And I miss the idea of that, that magical place, like that place where people love to come. We were not a store where you would have to do your taxes. We were not a store that was going to give you grief over a mortgage. You know, it was about fun. It was about delivering, literally selling fun. And I, I have to say that that's, that's a unique experience. I haven't had ever any, anywhere else. She's just so much fun to talk to. Uh, I want to have her back because we just barely scratched the surface there. Yeah. How cool is it that the thing she misses most about being in the magic shop was that that moment where she could make a connection for a kid, uh, especially a girl in her case, about how cool magic could be. And she could see the light bulbs going off. And, and now she's got this not-for-profit magic cannon, mm -hmm. which essentially uh, allows her to continue to provide that moment for kids and adults for that matter, but just so cool that that moment now exists essentially as a not-for-profit that she uh, she manages. Yeah, no, what a great way to take take what you love and find another way to do it. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of grew up around magic. I didn't, but you, your brother Rick uh, has been a magician forever. Do you have any uh, memories of, of when that spark happened in you because of what he was doing? Yeah, it happened pretty early, you know, because uh, he is... I, I was the last, I was the baby. So um, Rick is 13 years older than me. And my sister is 18 years older than me. So uh, by the time I came along, Rick was well into his career in magic. He had started much younger uh, than 13. But by the time I was able to sort of process things as a kid, let's say five or six years old, Rick would use me uh, to test things that he was doing. And I remember uh, in our shared bedroom at my parents' house before he moved out, uh, him doing a trick uh, with uh, a, a milk can and milk somehow coming out my elbow to fill a pitcher. And it, boy, it was tremendously funny to me at the time. And I still chuckle about it now. He also, uh, you know, my favorite trick in magic, it's bar none, might be Glorpy. I loved that trick. I love what, what is that trick? Glorpy? Yeah. Glorpy, the Gerculating Ghost, was invented by uh, a magician and a guy who was the uh, heir to the Madden's resort fortune, uh, Bill Madden and Bernie Trueblood. And they created what's called Mad Blood Creations. And perhaps their most famous trick is Glorpy, the Gerculating Ghost. You take a, a handkerchief or a foulard, whichever you prefer, and you fold it into corners. And th that is sort of the uh, doorway to the spirit world. And then you close that up and you put your fingers on it. And so does a, an assistant from the audience. And suddenly the, the handkerchief will come to life and start to bop around. And now there are several versions of it. 
uh, Hiram, the Haunted Hank. Um, there's some, uh, Eugene Berger marketed a version of it, but it's my favorite trick. And my brother did it for years and years and years and wouldn't let me know how it was done. Uh, and I went to try to buy it at Eagle Magic Store in Minneapolis and Larry wouldn't sell it to me because I, I, it was not the right time for me to have that trick. So it, years later, when I finally got it, I still have several versions of it. It's not being made anymore, but you can sometimes find them on eBay. And I, for a long time, it was a staple uh, in the Haunted Magic show uh, that I do at Halloween time. In fact, uh, I wanted to do a slate routine, but Eugene Berger said, no, 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 who uses slates anymore? Nobody, they didn't, people even know what they are. But this with Glorpy and it coming to life in front of the people and a set of, uh, we used uh, like index cards for the message, the spirit message. This is very, and, it, and he was absolutely right. It, it was oh. the showstopper of the show. Of course he was right. Yeah. I don't think anyone's, the, the sentence, oh, and Eugene was completely wrong about that, yeah. has never really been uttered. Doesn't have very often. But no. my brother, you know, then when he really started performing a lot, uh, he drafted me as uh, probably a freshman or sophomore in high school, uh, maybe even younger. I could have been still in grade school to be his backstage help. So his wife, uh, they were married in 71, just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Wow. Uh, uh, his wife was the onstage assistant and I was the backstage assistant. So I was uh, uh, triggering the music and uh, I was putting rabbits in boxes and doves in cages. And there's some great stories there, but yeah, it's it in your blood, a really joyful time in my life. I remember one Christmas, we probably did 50 shows over the course of, of three or four weeks. Uh, and we were out you know, sometimes two a day. And I remember when it was all over, I remember being in my bedroom and just weeping copiously that it was over and that, oh. you know, we didn't have a show lined up, uh, you know, until February and the blue and gold dinner season would start. But I remember just being so emotional about it being done uh, for the year that, uh, yeah, I have nothing but terrific memories of, of growing up as a magician's brother. Oh, that's so cool. I, I, of course, didn't have that because there was no magic in my family. And even though Eagle Magic was just downtown and I spent a lot of time downtown as a young kid because my dad wa worked at, at Plymouth Furs downtown Minneapolis uh, on 10th Street you know between between Nicollet and Marquette. Sure. And so I would come down on Saturdays and hang out with him and then was allowed to explore to a certain degree the downtown area. I mean, not a lot of nine-year-olds were walking over to the Forum Cafeteria and buying themselves lunch, but I was one of them. Uh, but I didn't go as far afield as Eagle Magic, which was in the Sexton building at that time. But there was a joke shop just down the corner, on the corner of 10th and Marquette, which I went to all the time. And it was so much fun. It was called Wallace of Minneapolis. And the man who owned it, his last name was Wallace. And he was the spitting image of Abraham Lincoln and would even dress up like Abraham Lincoln at times. And it was probably the late 60s version of Spencer Gifts, kind of, but with a much more uh, macabre bent to it in that there was a lot of dark, weird stuff there, but they're also fun little, you know, quasi magi magic tricks. I have no memory of that, John. And that would have been so right up my alley. It would have been. Yeah, Wallace, Minneapolis. Uh, I'm going to post a couple of pictures uh, on the show notes for this. It was uh, just a delightful place to go. And then, of course, Eagle Magic I found when I was in high school and Twin Cities Magic after that. But those early years were all uh, all about Wallace and the weird stuff he had there. I am so sorry I never got there. I went to Eagle, 708 Portland Avenue in Minneapolis. Uh, with my brother and by myself when I could get, you know, uh, yeah. get there with wheels eventually. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, who doesn't have a fond, if you grew up in Minnesota, who doesn't have a fond memory of going into Eagle Magic Store on Portland Avenue and talking with Larry or looking at the joke counter or looking at the magic counter, or Larry yeah. demonstrating tricks for people. It was great. And then Twin Cities Magic uh, in downtown St. Paul, what a great magic store that was in its day. We're very lucky to have within close proximity two pretty good magic shops. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yes. Well, anyway, we'll talk more about growing up in magic in the next two episodes. Right now, um, I think we need to get into our chapter 10. Let me quickly recap for those of you who don't remember. Uh, in the last chapter we listened to at the last episode, Eli went to the reception after Gray's memorial, and we got to meet Bitterman, possible suspect. Who knows? We got to see more of Ariana, more of Franny. I think you know. I, I actually, it's been a while. Uh, <laughs> I, I know I've got it narrowed down to a handful of people. <laughs> Uh, we met uh, Boone, who worked uh, along with Nova with Gray. And as the chapter was wrapping up, Eli was just giving Nova a ride home. The Ambitious Card and Eli Marks Mystery. Chapter 10. It's that house over there, the one on the right. No left, it's on the corner. Nova pointed a long, thin finger as I drove, and I noticed that not only were her fingernails painted black, but also that tiny, sparkling stars were visible in that blackness. She saw me glancing at her nails and smiled proudly. It's a special nail polish. I made it myself. I call it Infinite Universe. The stars actually glow in the dark. Cool, huh? You should market that, I said as I pulled the car into a parking space across the street from the unlit house that her incessant, if imprecise, stream of verbal directions had led us to. I will someday, when I get around to it, but who has the time? She opened the passenger door and stepped out, turning back to me as she did. Will you come in until I get the lights on? I don't like going in without the lights on. She didn't wait for a response, but closed the car door and was across the street and halfway up the front steps, before I had even got myself unleashed from my seatbelt. I got out of the car and looked around, not entirely certain where we were. I knew we were somewhere in the Prospect Park neighborhood in southeast Minneapolis, a tangle of curved streets that encircle Tower Hill Park and border our sister city of St. Paul. Standing by the car, I looked up and I could see the small light atop the Witch's Tower, a water tower at the top of the park. The peak of the tower, which really did resemble a witch's hat, was visible from just about anywhere in the Prospect Park neighborhood, but it wasn't a particularly helpful directional landmark because you couldn't tell by looking at it which side of the park you were near. It had been an informative, if a bit tiring, 20-minute drive from Dr. Bitterman's house across town. I don't know if it was due to the alcohol, but Nova talked nearly nonstop. I learned all about her living situation. Currently without a permanent address, she was something of a professional house sitter moving from assignment to assignment. Her boyfriend troubles, the most current being Boone, with Gray right behind that, and someone named Dewey before that. The quality of sex with said bows. Just okay with Boone, boring with Gray, transcendental with Dewey. And finally her deeply held beliefs about her own unique psychic gifts, a natural intuitive. She was best at communicating with animals and could also communicate with fairies when the stars were properly aligned. When all that information was jumbled in with her inexact driving directions, go left here, no wait, not here, where are we? Suddenly, the low-grade headache I was experiencing made perfect sense. Plus, on top of that, I realized after we left the reception that I had not actually ever gotten anything to eat. It was just that kind of night. By the time I reached the top of the steps, Nova had unlocked the front door and was standing back from it, apparently waiting for me to step into the darkness and search for the light switch. I probably should have left some lights on, but the sun was still out when I left. And yet, here it is, nighttime and it's dark. Tough thing to plan for. I looked at her and saw that my sarcasm was completely wasted. She was peering into the house, squinting. I think the light switch is on the left. No, the right. No, the left. I stepped into the house, placed my right hand on the right wall just inside the door, and found the light switch, in the same spot you might find it in perhaps 99% of the homes in America. I flipped the switch and the lights popped on, which produced a slight, oh, from Nova, as if we were witnessing a small and sadly unimpressive fireworks display. There you go, I said, standing back from my handiwork. You're all set. Can you come in and help me check the house? She waited for me to go in instead of her. Check the house for what? 
Strangers? Do you often get strangers? I don't like to stay in an unfamiliar house at night until I've checked to make sure that no strangers have gotten in. Her tone was emphatic. I stepped into the house and she followed me, shutting and locking the front door behind us. It was a pleasant, homey living room in what appeared to be a pleasant, homey house. The neighborhood was favored by professors at the nearby University of Minnesota campus, and this definitely felt like an educator's home. Two walls of the living room were lined with bookcases, while another held a large tapestry of possibly Mexican origin. The hardwood floors were covered by worn but clean oriental rugs. A staircase just inside the front foyer ran up to the second floor, and a hall straight ahead of me appeared to lead into the kitchen. The far end of the living room was open, off to the left, probably leading to a standard dining room. No strangers were in sight. Where would you like to start? First we check this floor. I shrugged and made my way through the living room into the predicted dining room. I turned on the lights without requiring directions on light switch placement and then made my way through the dining room into the adjoining kitchen. Nova followed noiselessly three paces behind me. I switched on the light in the kitchen, glanced down the hall back toward the living room and foyer, and then turned to Nova. So far, so good. Now what? Make sure the back door is locked. I walked over to the door and gave it a cursory check. It was, in fact, locked and bolted. Ground floor is secure, ma'am, I said. She smiled nervously. Now the basement. Of course, I said. The basement. A favored hiding spot for serial killers and lunatics. Don't make jokes, she said seriously, sounding more sober than she had in the last hour. Check the basement. The door to the basement was down the hall between the kitchen and the front foyer. I stopped at the door. Nova stopped three steps behind me. I opened the door and turned to her. So, even though movies have cautioned us for the last 40 years not to go into the basement, I said with mock seriousness, you're asking me to ignore all those collective warnings and go down there? She didn't even pause to think this over. Yes? she said quickly, and check the entire basement, including under the stairs and that creepy room in the back, and there's a trunk down there. Look in the trunk. Any job worth doing is worth doing well, I mumbled as I flipped on the light to the basement and headed down the stairs into the murk and beyond. Once I reached the bottom, I looked up to see Nova, silhouetted in the doorway. I considered doing the old reach-your-own-arm-around-from-behind gag and drag myself further into the basement, screaming, but I realized that such an action would probably have put the poor thing into cardiac arrest. So I simply turned and continued into the basement. The lighting was dim, even by basement standards, but I could see all four corners from where I stood, and I saw no other creatures, humanoid or otherwise. The footprint of a large octopus-style furnace system was still visible on the floor, but it had been replaced with a slimmer, more modern version, which was tucked neatly in one corner. A door hung halfway open across the room. I crossed to it and opened it completely, revealing a small pantry that once held pickled and stewed food supplies, but which now sat dusty and empty. A quick check under the stairs revealed a pair of his and hers bicycles that had not seen sunlight for quite a while, and three folded lawn chairs that had also seen better days. I gave one last look around the basement and was about to head back upstairs when I remembered that Nova had mentioned a trunk. I turned and scanned the room again, finally spotting it on the other side of the furnace. Upon closer inspection, it hardly qualified as a trunk, and if someone was hiding in it, they couldn't be much more than three feet tall. But my mission included opening the trunk so I stepped forward and flipped the two rusty latches, half expecting a demented jack-in-the-box to spring out. Sadly, nothing that exciting emerged. Instead, all I found was a stack of musty life magazines, along with the obligatory pile of National Geographics. My mission accomplished, I returned to the stairs and headed back up to the first floor. All clear. Now, on to the second floor, I suggested as I turned off the basement light and shut the door. First, check the back door. I did that already. We need to check it again. I looked at the door, then looked at her. Did you unlock it while I was downstairs? She shook her head categorically. Did you touch it in any way? Another head shake. 
Did anyone else come in here and touch it while I was in the basement? Head shake. But you still want me to check it again? She nodded. I sighed. Let's check the back door, I said cheerfully. I walked the eight steps to the door. It was, in fact, still completely secured. I jiggled the door handle for verisimilitude. I looked to her, and she turned and gestured down the hall toward the front door. I passed her and headed down there wordlessly. Without being asked, I double-checked the front door, which was also still locked. Nova had followed me. She gave me a smile of thanks and then looked up the stairs. Have you considered that house-sitting might not be the ideal occupation for you? I love it during the day. Unable to refute that train of logic, I headed up the stairs with Nova three steps behind me. The second floor consisted of a single hall with two doors on the left side, one door on the right, and one door at the far end. All the rooms were dark. Which one first? I asked as I turned to Nova, who stood motionless three steps behind me on the staircase. First, my room, then go clockwise. Clockwise. It works best that way. I took a deep breath. Which one is your room? The first door on the... She gave up trying to discern right from left and pointed to the first door on the right. I stepped in and found the light switch. I flipped the switch, which turned on a lamp on the bedside table. This was clearly the master bedroom, with a large queen bed taking up most of the room. Without requiring direction, I inspected the closet and under the bed, then stopped at the mirror over the dresser. I leaned forward and peered into it. "'What are you doing?' Nova asked from her position in the doorway. "'Checking the other side of the mirror.' "'The other side?' "'Yeah, to make sure no one is there on the other side.' Nova stepped forward tentatively and joined me. We both peered into the glass. I glanced over at her to see her earnestly staring into her reflection, and for a second I felt like a real ass. I think we're good, I said. Keep an eye on it while I check the other rooms. She continued to stare into the mirror while I made my way out of the room and into the hall, shutting the door behind me. Obediently moving clockwise, I checked the other two bedrooms, both of which were blissfully devoid of strangers. One was a home office. The other was a guest room that was now overrun with unwanted items from the rest of the house. I checked the small bathroom as well, including pulling back the shower curtain, and then headed back down the hall to the master bedroom. All clear, I said as I opened the door and walked into the room. I stopped dead in my tracks. She was naked. Of course she was. Why wouldn't she be? Standing in the center of the room, completely naked. I should have seen it coming. Oh, my, was all that came out of my mouth. She was stunning, of course. I expected that, but I had not anticipated the tattoos. She had a lot of tattoos, starting on her shoulders and moving in varying patterns and illustrations all the way down to her ankles. They meshed perfectly with the curves of her body, seeming to be a part of her, as natural as her skin. One design in particular, a half moon directly beneath her left breast, was exceptionally captivating, almost eclipsing the breast itself. What's this all about? I finally said. Well, I don't like to sleep alone, she said, sounding almost shy. I mean, for a naked person. And yet you insist on banishing strangers from the house. What? She was, admittedly, not my best comedy audience. I took a different tact. Thanks, but I don't think so. You don't find me attractive? On the contrary, just the opposite. And you're not married? Yes, I'm not married. Do you have a girlfriend? Sort of, I hedged. You do or don't? My hedging confused her. To be honest, I was a little confused myself. I have someone I'm interested in. So that means you can't sleep with me? In my world, yes. She shook her head and nearly giggled, holding one hand up to her mouth. You're weird. Hello, pot. Kettle's waiting for you in the lobby. What? 
Never mind. She turned and headed toward the bed, completely unselfconscious. She pulled the covers off. I'm going to go to sleep. Then I'll be on my way, I said, moving toward the hall. No, 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 she said plaintively. Can't you stay until I fall asleep? I'll fall asleep faster if you stay. I stood in the doorway for a long moment while she climbed into bed and got herself all comfortable and arranged. She smiled at me and gestured toward a high-backed chair near the bed. Realizing there was no other gracious way out of the house, I made my way across the room and settled into the chair. Tell me a story, she said, as she reached over and flipped the switch on the table lamp, returning the room to darkness. The only light in the room came from the street light out the window. In the dim light, I could barely see her as she laid her head on the pillow and closed her eyes. I don't know any stories, I said. Then do something magical. I can't work magic in the dark. Oh, I bet you could. This was followed by a wicked little laugh. Come on. It will help me sleep. So you want to fall asleep, I said. Let me see. I'm sure there's something in my act that fits that bill. I thought for a few moments, and then an idea came to me. Okay, here's one. My friend Nathan does this trick all the time. He's a kid's magician. I love kid's magicians, she said softly. I want you to pick a number between one and nine. Twelve, she answered quickly, and then giggled. Pick a number between one and nine, and don't tell me what it is. There was a long moment while she thought this through. Got it, she said finally. Okay, take that number and multiply it by nine. Multiply it by nine. Another pause. Okay, I got it. Okay, now whatever that answer is, add those two digits together. Together? Yes, like if you had 27, you'd add two and seven together. Oh, got it. Now, whatever that total is, subtract five from it. Her voice was very quiet. I'm subtracting five. Now it gets fun. It's fun already. Okay, it gets more fun. Take the number you got when you subtracted five, okay, and find the corresponding letter of the alphabet. Like, if you had one, that would be A. If you had two, that'd be B. Okay, Another pause. I could see her lips moving silently in the light from the street lamp. I've got the letter. Okay, now think of a country that starts with that letter. There was a long silence, and then she said very softly, I've got one. Now take the second letter in the name of that country and think of an animal whose name starts with that letter. Okay. Her voice was sounding very far away. Now think about the color of that animal. I've got the color. Her voice was just above a whisper. Using my magical powers, I can tell you that the country you were thinking of was Denmark. Yes, it was. It was Denmark. I could actually hear the smile in her voice. And the animal you were thinking of was an elephant. It was an elephant, a big elephant. And the color you were thinking of was... I stopped in mid-sentence, silently cursing myself. This is a very standard trick that always played out the same way, and I had stupidly forgotten the nearly inevitable outcome. The country was always Denmark, the animal was always elephant, and the color was always... And your color was... Gray. I waited for a reaction from Nova, and after what seemed like a very long time... She gave me one. The only sound in the house was her steady breathing. She had fallen asleep. I sat for what felt like a long time in the dark, still room, enjoying the quiet, with only the sound of Nova's breathing breaking the silence. I had no immediate desire to get up. I had nowhere I needed to be, and it had been a long, strange day, and the chair was more comfortable than it had first appeared. I reviewed the events of the day, reran conversations through my head, and tried as best I could to sort things out. In the end, answers eluded me. My reverie was broken by a slight chirp from my iPhone, signaling the delivery of a text message. I glanced over at Nova, 
hoping that the soft sound had not awoken her, and was glad to see in the faint light that her eyes were still closed. I flipped off the ringer to forestall any future beeps, chirps, or actual ringing. I didn't recognize the phone number from which the text had been issued. The text read simply, Did you get the drunk girl home okay? M. I ran the initial M through my mind quickly, and then it hit me. Megan, texting me, at night, would wonders never cease. I texted back, making as little noise as possible so as not to rouse Nova. Yes, safe and sound. Moments later, a response came. Fun talking to you to day. I hit the keys quickly and quietly, recognizing that the abbreviations Megan was employing might speed things up and yet opting against them. Me too. Good time. Her response was almost instantaneous. Again sometime? I thought about the correct response for a long moment, weighing content and word choice. I settled on, absolutely. Maybe lunch? I hit send, and although I can't be certain, I may not have actually taken a breath until the response came. Sounds GR8. Later in the week, I cheered silently and almost got up to dance around the chair, but then thought better of it. I didn't have enough material to get Nova back to sleep. Instead, I carefully typed and sent my reply. Yes. A reply came back through the ether with remarkable speed. Talk later. Sleep well. G. Night. M. I typed my response. Good night. I held the phone for a long time, happily scrolling back and forth through the text exchange. Then I shut the phone screen off and I set it in my lap, closing my eyes for what I thought would be a short rest before getting up, leaving the house, getting into my car and driving home. When I opened my eyes, sunlight was streaming in through the bedroom windows and my iPhone was vibrating insistently against my leg. <laughs> And that's end of chapter 10. Had mm. an interesting encounter there with Nova in her house. And uh, we got to use the famous gray elephant in Denmark trick. Which is uh, a good one. It it's is a, a very good, good one. one. Yeah, it took me a while to find that doing some research. I needed something that he could actually just say to her that would work for the reader as well. And I got to the end of it just like he did and found, realized, oh, wait, the color is gray. And that's the name of the guy who died. Should I use that? Does it seem like I went way out of my way to do that? But it was a completely a coincidence that uh, that trick ends with a uh, gray elephant in Denmark, but it's a, it's a good trick. It is. It's great. It's great. Now people are going to, that's going to resurface all over Switzerland. It's going to be huge in Switzerland. <laughs> well, we can only hope. All right. Well, that wraps up this episode. I want to thank Julie Ang again for taking the time to chat about her experiences growing up in magic. Absolutely. And check out the show notes uh, for videos of Julie performing magic, as well as video of her dad, Tony Ang, performing. It's pretty great. Yeah, it's not great quality video, but it's uh, it's really cool to see him doing that. And also check out the show notes for links to all of Julie's social media pages, her website, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You know what? Let me just recap for people. This was episode 111, which can only mean based on the twisted numbering system, that the next episode uh, will feature chapter 11 of The Ambitious Card. Did I do that math right? By Jove, I think he's got it. So please give us a rating at whatever platform you're listening to. They tell me that's important. So if you get a chance, leave us a review. Yeah, and it helps too, because I think it, it gets you bumped up on the algorithm. And then people in Switzerland tune into the podcast, which is great for us. And make sure you don't miss an episode. So hit that subscribe button, will you folks? We'll be back next time with the amazingly hysterical, although not an impressionist, no. Jeff yeah. Altman. We want to be clear. He's, he, he says he's not an impressionist, and yet he does upwards of a dozen impressions on the show. Maybe the best impression of Di Vernon ever. Maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the best. Maybe the best. So tune in for that on our next episode, episode 112. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. 
This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham, produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.